a Spanish colonizer, Lucas Vasquez de Ayon, founded in the summer of 1526, a community whose probable location was at or near the mouth of the P.D. River in what is now South Carolina. The settlement consisted of about 500 Spaniards and 100 Negro slaves. Trouble soon beset it. Illness caused numerous deaths, carrying off in October Ayon himself. Internal dissension arose and the Indians grew increasingly suspicious and hostile. Finally, probably in November, several of the slaves rebelled and fled to the Indians. The next month, what was left of the adventurers, some 150 souls, returned to Haiti, leaving the rebel Negroes with their Indian friends as the first permanent inhabitants, other than the Indians, in what was to soon be the United States. This is Herbert Aptica writing in 1969 about American Negro slave revolts. The notes from this part are from his article earlier, earlier article, the 1939 article, Maroons Within the Present Limit of the United States. An ever-present feature of antebellum Southern life was the existence of camps of runaway Negro slaves, often called Maroons, when they all but established themselves independently on the frontier. These were seriously annoying, for they were sources of insubordination. They offered havens for fugitives, served as bases for marauding expeditions against nearby plantations, and, at times, supplied the nucleus of leadership for planned uprisings. Some contemporary writers and a few later historians have noticed, in a general and meager way, the existence of this feature of American slavery. It merits, however, detailed treatment. Evidence of the existence of at least 50 such communities in various places and at various times from 1672 to 1864 has been found. The mountainous, forested, or swampy regions of South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Louisiana, Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, and Alabama appear to have been the favorite haunts for these black Robin Hoods. At times, a settled life rather than a pugnacious and migratory one, was aimed at, as is evidenced by the fact that these Maroons built homes, maintained families, raised cattle, and pursued agriculture. But this is all, this all but settled life appears to have been exceptional. The most noted of such communities was that located in the Dism Swamp between Virginia and North Carolina. It seems likely that about 2,000 Negroes, fugitives, or the descendants of fugitives lived in this area. They carried on a regular, if illegal, trade with white people living on the borders of the swamp. Such settlements may have been more numerous than available evidence would indicate, for their occupants aroused less excitement and less resentment than the guerrilla outlaws. The activities of Maroons in Virginia in 1872 approached the point of rebellion so that a law was passed urging and rewarding the hunting down and killing of these outlaws. In March 1811, a runaway community in a swamp in Cabarrus County, North Carolina was wiped out. These Maroons had bid defiance to any force whatsoever and were resolved to stand their ground, according to the Edmonton Gazette, March 22, 1811. The Norfolk Herald, June 29, 1818, referred to the serious damages occasioned by a group of some 30 runaway slaves acting together with white men in Princess Anne County, Virginia, quoted in the New York Evening Post. It reported, too, the recent capture of a leader and an old woman member of the outlaws. The Norfolk Herald, May 12, 1823, contains an unusually full account of Maroons under the heading, A Serious Subject. It declares that the citizens of the southern part of Norfolk County, Virginia, quote, have for some time been kept in a state of mind peculiarly harassing and painful from the too apparent fact that their lives are at the mercy of a band of lurking assassins against whose fell designs neither the power of the law nor vigilance or personal strength and intrepidity can avail. These desperados 
are runaway Negroes, commonly called outliers. Their first object is to obtain a gun and ammunition, as well as to procure game for subsistence as to defend themselves from attack or accomplish objects of vengeance. From the New York Evening Post, May 15, 1823. Several men had already been killed by these former slaves, one, Mr. William Walker, very recently. This aroused great fear. Quote, no individual after this can consider his life safe from the murdering aim of these monsters in human shape. Everyone who has happily rendered himself obnoxious to their vengeance must indeed calculate on sooner or later falling a victim, quote, to them. Indeed, one slaveholder had received a note from these amazing fellows suggesting it would be healthier for him to remain indoors at night, and he did. Maroons were important factors in causing slave insubordination in Samson, Bladen, Onslow, Jones, New Hanover, and Dublin counties, North Carolina, from September through December 1830. Citizens complained that their slaves are almost uncontrollable. They go and come and go when they please. And if an attempt is made to correct them, correct them means to whip them. If an attempt is made to correct them, they immediately fly to the woods and there continue for months and years, committing grievous depredations on our cattle, hogs, and sheep. One of these fugitives, Moses, who had been out for two years, was captured in November. From him, one elicited the information that an uprising was imminent and the conspirators had arms and munitions secreted, that they had runners or messengers to go between Wilmington, New Bern, and Elizabeth City. A later item dated Wilmington, uh, January 7th, 1831, Wilmington, North Carolina. There has been much shooting of Negroes in this neighborhood recently in consequence of symptoms of liberty having been discovered among them from the New York Sentinel. It is of interest to note that Richmond papers on receiving the first reports of Nat Turner's revolt in August 1831, asked concerning the rebels, were they connected with the desperados who harassed North Carolina last year? In the Richmond Inquirer, August 30th, 1831. The year 1837 also saw the start of the Florida or Seminole War which was destined to drag on until 1843. This war, quote, conducted largely as a slave catching enterprise for the benefit of the citizens of Georgia and Florida, end quote, was before its termination to take an unknown number of Indian and Negro lives together with the lives of 1,500 white soldiers and the expenditure of 20 million. The Indians had at the beginning of the hostilities about 1,650 warriors and 250 Negro fighters. The latter were, quote, the most formidable foe, more bloodthirsty, active, and revengeful than the Indians, end quote. A letter of August 25th, 1856, to Governor Thomas Bragg of North Carolina, signed by Richard A. Lewis and 21 other citizens, informed him of a very secure retreat for runaway Negroes in a large swamp between Bladen and Robeson counties. There, quote, for many years past, and at this time, there are several runaways of bad and daring character, destructive to all kinds of stock and dangerous to all persons living by or near said swamp, end quote. Slaveholders attacked these Negroes on August 1st, 1856, but accomplished nothing and saw one of their own number killed. The Negroes ran off cursing and swearing and telling them to come on they are ready for them again. In October 1862, a scouting party of three armed whites investigating a maroon camp containing 100 men, women, and children in Surrey County, Virginia, were killed by these fugitives. The calendar of Virginia State Papers, Volume 11. There's a separate video titled Gilbert Wooten that goes into more detail about that one. A Confederate newspaper noticed similar activities in North Carolina in 1864. 
Richmond Daily Examiner, January 14, 1864. It reported, it's difficult to find words of description of the wild and terrible consequences of the Negro raids in this obscure theater of war. In the two counties of Currituck and Camden, there are said to be from five to 600 Negroes who are not in the regular military organization of the Yankees, but who, outlawed and disowned by their masters, lead the lives of the, of the banditti, roving the country with fire and committing all sorts of horrible crimes upon the inhabitants. This present theater of guerrilla warfare has, at this time, the most important interest for our authorities. It is described as a rich country and one of the most important sources of meat supplies that is now accessible to our armies. The account ends with a broad hint that white deserters from the Confederate Army were fighting soldier, shoulder to shoulder with the self-emancipated Negroes. The story of the American Maroons is of interest not only because it forms a fairly important part of the history of the South and of the Negro, but also because of the evidence it affords to show that the conventional picture of slavery as more or less delightful patriarchal system is fallacious. The corollary of this fallacious picture, docile, contented slaves, is also, of course, seriously questioned. Indeed, taking this material on Maroons into conjunction with what recently presented on servile revolts leads one to assert that American slavery was a horrid form of tyrannical rule, which often found it necessary to suppress ruthlessly the desperate expressions of discontent on the part of its outraged victims.